Good morning. My name is Lene Erickson Hatulski, and I am the Vice President for Social Policy and Politics at Third Way. And we're very excited to have all of you here with us today. Um, a lot of Democrats woke up quite depressed the day after the 2016 election. And it wasn't just Donald Trump. In fact, uh, the, the thumping that we received in the White House actually had been uh, forecasted through several years of losses across down ballot. And actually, since the apex of the Democratic takeover in 2009, uh, Democrats lost 20% of their Senate seats, a quarter of their House seats, 45% of their governorships, and uh, over half of their controls of state legislatures. And the party actually was in, if you looked across the map, the worst position it had been in since the Civil War. So everybody's really been obsessed with the question, how will they dig out? And at Third Way, we think that we need to have a broad path in order to dig out, that there's no one kind of voter or one kind of district that's going to be able to deliver that victory, and that in many of the majority-making House and Senate places, we actually can't just toss aside every single Trump voter. So we're really excited to have with us today uh, three folks who understand this better than really anyone else. We have three Democrats who have won in very different places with very different kinds of voters, and they're here to share their insights about what it takes to win. Now, if you're joining us uh, through the live stream or you're in the audience and you want to tweet, we're using the hashtag diverse Dems so that you can join into the conversation. So these folks need no introduction, but let me give a little context about why they're the right people to have this conversation with. First, we have Senator Joe Manchin, who's a third way co-chair. By presidential performance, West Virginia is one of the five most Republican states in the country. Mitt Romney won 62% in 2012, and Donald Trump increased that to 69% last year. When Senator Manchin joined West Virginia's five-member congressional delegation, four of those members were Democrats. Now he's the only one. He won his last election with 61% of the vote, and he's up again in 2018. And he's won five statewide elections in West Virginia, two for Senate, two for governor, and one for secretary of state. He's, in fact, never lost a general election in the state. Second, we have Congressman Emanuel Cleaver from Missouri's 5th District. The 5th District covers parts of five different counties. And Donald Trump won four of those counties. The only one he didn't win was the one that's the home of Kansas City proper. Congressman Cleaver has represented that district in Congress since 2005. And in 2016, he outperformed Hillary by four points and won in two of the five counties, including one of the Trump counties. Back in 2012, he won with 61% of the vote and took three of the five counties, including two of them had, that had gone for Mitt Romney. And he's also surrounded entirely by Republican districts, including the swing district of Kansas three. Finally, last but certainly not least, we have Congresswoman Susan Del Bene, who is also a third-way honorary co-chair. She's from Washington's first congressional district, which contains parts of four counties, starting in the northern Seattle suburbs and then working its way up to the Canadian border. Congresswoman Del Bene has represented that district since 2012. In 2016, she won re-election with 55% of the vote. She previously ran for swing district Washington 8 in 2010 before it was redistricted in 2011, and she lost by only four points in the Tea Party year of 2010, outperforming the 2008 candidate, even though, uh, even though they had a much harder headwinds in 2010. So the district she currently represents shares a significant border with that swing district. She's also the vice chair of the New Democrat Coalition, which is made up of 61 solutions-oriented House Democrats who are pro-economic growth, pro-innovation, and pro-fiscal responsibility. So we're going to start with a conversation with us on stage, and then we're going to open it up and save lots of time for questions from folks in the audience. But I'm going to start with Senator Manchin, and then let other folks jump in. Sir, what do you think that we can learn from Democrats who have managed to win in places that Trump won, sometimes by double digits? I think you have two. First of all, if you have a person who's running as a Democrat in a state that's uh, overwhelmingly red or has voted uh, red, uh, that person has to d identify themselves in their independency. Uh, give you an example. When I was governor, 
and Bob Byrd died and I ran for the Senate. I just, I never knew the animosity towards Washington, even in my state. My numbers, I was always very, very blessed and very honored to have good numbers support from the people in West Virginia in my statewide elections, whether it be governor, secretary of state, or whatever I had done. And all of a sudden, as soon as I put my name on the ballot to be a U.S. Senator, they dropped 10 or 15 points immediately, thinking I was going to fall into the swamp <laughs> and be controlled by the very liberal Democrats, the Washington Democrats. That's exactly, we were fighting that from day one. I couldn't figure it out. Uh, David Eichenbaum's here with me, and David's been with me for a long time, does my media and everything, but we just just trying to grab this thing and say, well, wait a minute, they know who you are. They know you've been very independent. It's all about West Virginia. It wasn't about Democrats or Republican, but they just thought Washington had such a grip on people. So we had to fight for our independence, and I think my fighting was shooting the rifle. <laughs> if you recall that ad, if you haven't seen it, that was one that kind of took us over the top. And Joe is different. He's independent. He'll do his own thing. And since then, I've said, I'm not a Washington Democrat. Uh, I'm a West Virginia Democrat. I'm a very proud West Virginia Democrat, and I have a lot of great friends that are proud West Virginia Republicans. But we always put our state and our country before we did our party. This is absolutely different here. The first time I was here, they said, someone came to me and said, uh, uh, Harry Reid did. And he said, Joe, this is going to be a party line vote. I never heard that term before. Party line vote? What's that mean? That means we're all supposed to hang together. I said, well, let me see the legislation. So I saw the legislation. I said, Harry, on my best day, I can't sell this crap. <laughs> on my best day, and I got, had some pretty good days, I couldn't sell that stuff. So once he figured out I was going to be Joe, not going to be, I said, you know, my allegiance to my state of West Virginia and to the people of this country and to the, to the opportunities that, and, and the quality of life that they would like to pursue. And, you know, we've held people responsible and accountable. And I've said this, government should be your partner, not your provider. As a Democrat, I stand by that slogan. It should be your partner, not your provider. But you have to have, your moral obligation is to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. That defines us a little differently. And the easy way to define, why are you still a Democrat? Why are we still Democrats in tough red areas? Just flip, it's much, it's much easier, it's expedient. I said, well, the bottom line when it comes to it, uh, day in and day out, the Republican, my friends in the Republican Party will take you to the bottom line. And I truly believe the Democrats will stop at the bottom of your heart. So the difference is the heart and, and the bottom line, I think. And that's who I am. You all are coming from different areas of the country. What do you see that folks in D.C. could learn from Democrats that win in those places? Everything. <laughs> uh, I, 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 th I think uh, we, have, we, we are missing a great opportunity when we ignore uh, the rural areas of the country. And uh, when we miss those opportunities, we need to understand that the Republicans are, um, you know, very anxious to take advantage of uh, our missed opportunities. They will take those missed opportunities, and they do. Uh, most people would assume an African American um, from mayor of Kansas City uh, would get elected to Congress from a predominantly minority district. Uh, my district is uh, barely 20% African American and about 9% uh, Latino. Um, and uh, I, I think if, we, if every district was designed like mine, every district in Congress, we'd be getting things done. Um, and so what, what happens is that we uh, you know, go to, to rural areas um, and, and actually talk down to them or talk about them. I mean, um, as I told one of my colleagues a couple of years ago, I know you, this is hard to believe, but the rural people have televisions too. And they look at the news too. They hear what uh, we are saying also. And, 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 and one of the keys, and the senator probably can relate to, relate to this as, as well as anyone, I don't have two messages. You know, I tell people all the time, catch me saying something uh, in the urban core of Kansas City, Missouri, it's our, our, the largest city in our state, and saying it differently when I go to a rural areas. I, I don't do it. And, and so I don't have to think about it. I can say what I believe. The, the other thing is uh, 
we, we, we won't even pay, uh, pay any attention to them. Look, I carried a town called Oric, Missouri. Oric. I'm sure some of you probably have vac vacation there. But uh, Oric uh, has 800 um, dwelling places, 800. And, uh, and so they, they have barely over 1,000 in their population. I carried it. No African Americans live there. Uh, no Latinos live there. Uh, but, you know, when, the, when a tornado hit the town, I was out there. Uh, and, and, and one of the things that I do is, I don't, don't take any photographs of me. I don't, this is not, you know, for the media. Uh, and they, appreciate, they appreciated that. And, and, and I, you know, stayed with them all during the tragedy because they get it. Here's what we've done. And, and, and maybe some of you already know this. If there is a disaster in a small town in the United States, they don't qualify for FEMA help unless there's $8 million worth of damage, uh, they don't meet the threshold and can't qualify for FEMA. So the whole government has conspired against them. Uh, and and, and, and they, they, they realize that. And, and I talked about it the whole time. I, I talk about it in the campaign. I, I deal with it uh, on, on my committee. I deal with it everywhere I go. It is wrong. And, and I, I think people, people want to know whether or not you're going to stand up for me. And, and, and once they realize that, then, oh, of course, we'll, we'll support you. So I, I think, uh, you know, w we need to also understand uh, that there's a symbiotic relationship between the rural areas and the urban core. Uh, as I will say when I'm in the rural care, uh, uh, areas, you know, I'm so glad that uh, you're a supporter of SNAP because uh, when the government buys your corn, in order to uh, help people who are uh, on SNAP, uh, you, you win, they win. And the other thing is, in my rural counties that you called off, every school in that rural county, county uh, has more than 51% of their students on the federal lunch program. Why in the world would we ignore people who are in trouble, who are being beaten and, and, and trounced? Uh, I mean, if, we, if Democrats represent them, they'll vote Democratic. It's just that simple. Um, well, you know, I, I want to reiterate something that Emmanuel just said, which is, um, you know, how important it is that we kind of look at policy, but also look at districts that different members of Congress represent and the input that goes into that policy. Because I have a district that was set up to be the most evenly divided district in the country, according to our redistricting commission. And, um, and so urban areas right out the suburbs of Seattle, up through the Canadian border, a lot of agriculture in my district. And in many cases, it's night and day, the, what people see and, and kind of the feedback we get from folks in our urban areas versus our rural areas. And I know when I joined Congress, I went on the agriculture committee because I wanted to make sure that I could be a voice for our farmers as well and, and talk about how important it is that we look at um, the issues that our, our farmers are going through, but also our rural areas are, um, need people to address, and that there's a strong voice there. And, um, and so I actually say all the time what he just said, which is if we had more districts that look like mine, um, I think our politics would be better. Because we'd realize there's not just black and white for every issue. There's not a right answer, a wrong answer. Many times um, things are more complicated. Um, there's different points of view if you understand kind of the underlying issues more. And if I hear feedback from people on both sides of an issue, I feel like I'm going to make a better decision and be able to defend why I made that decision versus kind of have a more myopic view. And um, similarly, we've had, um, we, when I was first elected, we had a, a terrible tragedy in my district. Um, a huge landslide that killed 43 people and um, in a very rural part of my district. And um, also very true, being there, doing everything you can, kind of, there's no partisanship when you're all working together to do whatever you can to help each other out and builds a strong community. And I think that feeling of trust is so important for folks to kind of break down partisan barriers and say, I can look this person in the eye. I know this person is going to stand up for my issues and in doing what they can. I know them as a person. 
And, um, and when you have that type of relationship, then it's less about the politics or what you hear on television. Um, and it's very directly about, is this person going to stand up and make smart decisions for us? Even if we don't agree all the time, at least they're going to listen. I know they'll be thoughtful in representing me. And I think that's so important to making sure that um, not only we're we doing the right thing for our districts, but we're bringing diverse voices to the table out here in Washington, DC. A lot of the things that you all have mentioned are things that incumbents can maybe do more easily because they already represent that place and they can um, you know, represent the, the interests of those people. What advice would you give to new folks who are running this year in, in some of these tougher districts? Well, there's, a, there's an old saying in politics, you better tell your story before someone tells one on you. Uh, it's hard to run defense, you know, you put a few points on the board first. So anyone running for the first time that is not well known in their state, or they're running for Congress or the Senate or whatever they're running for, if they're running to come to Washington, or even running then, you have to declare and be able to tell who you are. And you have to show something in your past that showed you to be independent, independent thoughtful, and, and caring. Uh, uh, there's an old saying also, my grandmother always said, is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So in West Virginia, people can shake your hand, look in your eyes, and see your soul. They were grown up with not a whole lot, but their own gut feeling. They knew how to survive. They had survival skills, hard workers, and you just didn't BS them. So you better be a real person. So again, how do you recruit? You recruit in areas, and, and what do you look for in that candidate? Can that candidate sell in a certain area? You know, be honest with some people. Say, I'm sorry, I don't think you can win. And I'll tell you why. You don't have any background, any experience, boom, 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 boom. And we don't have enough money to sell you. <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, we should be recruiting this candidate. That's what they're doing, and Republicans have done it really much better. And look at what you just said. Republicans have 45 governors. They systematically went state by state by state by state. They are positioned for themselves to set up for the next, uh, the next census, redistricting. If you want to change this country and you want to change the atmosphere here, it should be all computer-driven models. It shouldn't be us sitting down, well, what do you think about this, Congressman? I'll take this area because it's shifting. I'll give you that area. That shouldn't happen, okay? And on the other hand, ought to be an ethical violation for any of us campaigning against a setting colleague once we get here. you got an environment. You, in West Virginia, if you go to work every day trying to get me fired, I'm going to meet you in the parking lot sooner or later. <laughs> I'm going to say, okay, I think I need to talk to you. This is the way things are done. You just don't do this. But here, we go to work every day in a hostile environment. If you have a D by your name, you're expected to be against every R. If you have an R by your name, you're expected to be against every D. You're expected to raise money, and then if you're in cycle, you're expected to even go in the state on the weekends and campaign against your setting colleague. And then Monday, you're expected to come back here and say, Congresswoman, what about, can we get together on this piece of legislation? <laughs> well, the hell we can. I'm, we're not going to do that. I mean, that's what they're, without saying, that's what they're thinking. So nothing happens. And everybody's like this. And they wonder why it doesn't work. So no, this is not rocket science. But those, <laughs> it's the folks who represent the swing districts that are the ones in the crosshairs all the time. Folks who represent highly partisan districts. How usually. Many, how many do you think are competitive? Out well, of 435 I think, uh, I think uh, the, there was a study done that said about, what, 90 or some degree of purple out of 435? Yeah, that's it. Cook says that there's 90 within that's kind of right. five of the national mean. But the, um, yeah, that, that's probably stretching it. That's, I think, the, the, the full range of possibilities. Um, but when you look at the Democratic um, House caucus, the current caucus, 85% of the current caucus is from one of those deep blue districts. So that's, you know, the colleagues that you're working with every day are mostly representing places that are very, very blue. I, I, would, yeah. I would also argue uh, that, uh, that we do know how to win uh, seats in such districts that we're, as we were talking about. Um, the problem is, and we saw a little of it in the uh, recent uh, House race in Georgia, where our candidate was told, you know, you didn't pass the litmus test on uh, certain things. Uh, um, I mean, that's absolutely crazy. We've got to get to the point where we understand that Democrats will not get into the majority unless we have blue dogs. Um, 
And, you know, we got we, our position needs to be, we don't care what color the dog, we just want, <laughs> as long as it's our dog. Uh, because the, the yeah, we, we, want, we need friendly dogs. And, 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 and the, the, the thing is, they, they won before, they won. And then what happens is then they get beat up by Democrats, you know, uh, for, for voting on something that uh, their constituents would like them to support. I mean, it's, it, it is absolutely crazy. And, uh, you know, the, the, the party of toleration or tolerance uh, sometimes <laughs> slips into intolerance. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we, we, we can see that from time to time. And I just listen to people. You know, uh, uh, you know, beating uh, Democrats beating up on some Democrat who voted opposite of what the majority, uh, uh, how the majority voted. My voting record is liberal, um, so it's a it's a weird kind of a, a deal. I mean, I, I get I get a, a an a 100 on every lib from every liberal group, and at the last election, I got a 100 from every rural organization. Mm -hmm. I, I think you can do it. Uh, if you're true, if you're true, uh, and, and, and not, I hate to use the word fake, man, I just messed up that word. Well, <laughs> you know what you're saying, and, and I'm not, I'm on the Georgia candidate there, uh, I think he's a fine young man. I think, you know, he did the best he probably could, but you picked a candidate that didn't live in the area, and so he had to fight residency from day one. So you get behind the eight ball and you have to find your way out of that. Why give them more than they need? Why give them information or give them fodder when you shouldn't be looking and recruiting in, in, a, in a, such a rich environment? Uh, that, was un, that was unfair to the young man to pull him into that, even though he had a desire to serve. I think knowing it's going to be hostile, that's what happened. Although it's also important to remember that that was a district where a Democrat shouldn't even have really had a chance. And so I think, it, it, I think that given that it was Tom Price's former district, it really says a lot about the environment today. The tea leaves show that twins were shifting, mm -hmm. and we did have a chance. It wasn't like we well, did the best he could. We had a chance to win, but you'd have had to buy, find someone of impeccable character that was rooted in that area that they couldn't. And then if you didn't like them because they're going to be associated with the liberal Democrat, uh, Washington Democrats, that's what he would have had to fight off or she would have had to fight off. But they couldn't root him on different, saying, well, you're not uh, from the area. You don't know the area. You never lived here before. You just moved in to take. Those are types of things that make it very difficult. But Republicans have been successful coming into my state. We have a, a, a congressman and an attorney general that couldn't win in any other state, moved to our state because Republicans <laughs> recruited him and sent him there, mm -hmm. knowing it was shifting, shifting winds. What do you think that, we, you know, we've talked about the fact that most of your colleagues, and this will probably continue to be the case, are from bluer places when you look across the caucus. What do you think those folks can do to help out the people that are always on, on the edge when it comes to, you know, the electoral math, the people that are always um, winning, having to win in the tougher districts? Always. <laughs> and senators, because senators run for the whole state, so I look at some of my friends uh, and I say uh, and I know there are counties so I pick a county where I know they got the living kick, uh, crap kicked out of them and I said how'd you do in that county oh it's a tough county I said welcome to my world my entire state's that way <laughs> gives them a little bit of an insight of what we're dealing with and how you have to be a little bit more tolerant I was asked one time what happened to the Democratic Party in West Virginia I said nothing's happened to the Democratic Party it's still a caring it's still all inclusive it's a big tent we love everybody but we've gotten to the point now to where we have to defend a rural Democratic Party versus an urban. Washington Democrats are urban. That's the, in everything we've done. And I've explained it this way. I said, I grew up in a state, uh, in a, a state that flipped in 1929, 1930 because of the Depression from Republican to Democrat. They were all uh, Roosevelt Democrats, my grandparents. So our state flipped overwhelmingly, 70, 75 percent Democrats. And they stayed that way all these years, uh, out of respect and out of uh, loyalty. But with that, they still had their very conservative roots, their personal roots of how they're going to live their life, how they're going to, what they're going to do in their house, how they're going to take care of their schools, things of that sort. They didn't want to be overreach. 
So I was asked the question, what happened? I said, well, I can tell you exactly what happened. I said, in West Virginia, the people in West Virginia, the Democrats in West Virginia who always believed that the Democratic Party was always for the working person or the underdog to give them a chance, help lift themselves up, uh, they believe now that the Democratic Party in Washington is the party that's preventing the working person from working. They've gotten so politically correct, so pristine, there's no balance between the economy and the environment. There's no in-between anymore. You're either all this way or all this way. And they've gotten so turned off, they says, hey, we're just going to vote differently and we vote. So you have to work much harder, much harder. And I, I actually think we have an opportunity to help our colleagues see that there are differing points of view out there and engage in that conversation. Um, I, had a, I went to a senior center recently to talk about health care and um, was talking to people at different tables. It was a breakfast, and I went up to one table, all men, um, and I walked up and introduced myself, and they said, we're Trump supporters. Um, and I said, that's OK. And the gentleman goes, no, it's not. <laughs> and I said, well, I represent everyone, and I want to hear your feedback. And we did start a conversation. And at the end, um, one gentleman said to me, I just want to thank you for coming and talking with us. And while we don't agree on everything, um, I appreciate that you took the time. And he was a veteran. And he said, I you know, fought in a war so that we could actually be in a place where we could have a healthy debate and have a country where we could have a healthy debate. And to him, it was important that we continue that. And I do think that many times, if we just start talking, we find places where we actually agree on more things than we think you do out right out front, because he was basically telling me, just leave us alone. And um, if I had just walked away, we probably never would have had a chance to learn a little bit about each other and realize there were places where we, we had a very common bond. And so I do think it's important, especially in this highly divided uh, time with a lot of rhetoric, that um, folks like ourselves who represent districts where there are many differing points of view, that we make sure people hear those and have a chance to experience that. And so I welcome the opportunity to have my colleagues come to parts of my district to hear from our farmers or, um, or folks who have differing points of view on issues so that they can understand and understand that maybe there are a lot of places we agree and there are places we disagree, but we should be able to have a dialogue. Yeah. Quickly. <clears throat> Last October, last Halloween, I did what I do every Halloween in Higginsville, Missouri. I stand in front of my office. They close, down, close, close off the streets. Higgins, Higginsville is a town of about 5,000. And all the merchants come out, and they, the kids line up, probably every kid in town uh, with their Halloween outfit, and they walk by, up, down, up the street, and everybody gives them candy. I'm standing in front of my office. A guy walks up to me gets right up in my face, and he says, Congressman, I just want you to know, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump, and then I'm going to vote for you. So my staff is standing around. Have you been in those cowboy movies where the, the good guy walks into the saloon, all the music stops, everybody? <laughs> is, that's, I mean, that's the way it was. Everybody stopped like, oh, Lord, what's going on? And so I'm trying to figure out what to say uh, to him. And so Kyle Wil Wilkins says, thank you. <laughs> my, one of my staffers. Uh, but so it's not as simple as, as people think. It's not as simple as people think. You know, uh, I mean, the, the, here's a guy. I mean, I, I can't, you, you couldn't figure that out unless you come to the conclusion, well, yeah, Cleaver is different. You know, he, he's, you know he's out here on Halloween. He's, uh, I, I took Secretary Vilsack. I got the sheriff to do a motorcade from uh, the airport to Odessa, Missouri, for a round table with my farmer's advisory committee. I mean, first time a cabinet member's ever been to Odessa in its history. And, and uh, I mean, so, I mean, these, it, it's, it's, it's one of these things where you give them attention, I mean, and, and you respond to their, their uh, concerns. And I think we can do a lot better. The issue is tolerance, political tolerance. Let me just say that talking about this is the comfort zone. I can go into a room in a political setting and, and you show me the candidates and I can pretty much handicap and tell you who I think is going to do better than the others. And it's the person that goes in the most uncomfortable c corner of that room, people who are not for them. A person will go in their uncomfortable zone. Get out of your comfort zone. I know the people are going to vote for me. 
I know my friends are in the room, and I can tell you a candidate's going to get the crap beat out of them when they stand there and talk to their friends all night long. And then I can tell you the games have been played, and we all do this, and you take shell people with you continuously, we type a candidate. If they're stupid enough to stand there and talk to one person, we keep them there all night long. Okay? <laughs> now, if, if, if someone is smart enough, they have a handler with them, and they say, uh, Congressman, uh, can I leave so-and-so? I'm going to go ahead and work some, talk to some people here. My, my staff's going to take care of you. You just have to know how to handle it. How about the person that won't shake your hand? How, we all had it happen. Mm -hmm. Won't shake your hand. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, have I done something personally to offend you? And if I've not, is there something you've heard about that maybe I can clarify? Mm -hmm. You can be surprised how you can start that conversation by not just walking away and say, oh, the hell with him mm -hmm. or her. You know, just engage them. There's something they're upset about. But make an effort. And people don't, they don't work it anymore. They think that everybody's going to sell everything on, on television and all your ads are going to, the ads can present you. You've got to sell yourself. They've got, you've got to be who you are, but you've got to be able to, to, you know, and people know if you like it or not. How many people have you met that you could tell hated politicking, hated the campaign? Probably pretty good if they'd have gotten in. Well, I'm sorry. If you can't get on first base, you're not going to score. You're just not going to score. It's the way the game's played. And people don't understand that. They have a hard time understanding how this process works. And, you know, they don't have to agree with you. They have to respect, you know, your decision. And you owe everybody an answer. You might not agree with me, but I can give you a thought process of how I came to a conclusion. And I've said this. If you can't change your mind, you can't change anything. If you made a mistake and your facts were wrong and other facts are presented to you, say, I made a mistake. We've got a situation all of us are in right now that's health care. It's killing. It's tearing this. It's tear. It's tore this country apart in 2009 and 10. It's continuing to rip us apart even further. And I said the Democrats made a mistake in 2010 passing it with no Republicans, but at least they went through the process. Republicans had input. Now the Republicans are doubling down, passing it without even input, with no Democrats, and they can't even get 50. Don't you think we ought to start working together? If not, we're going to be on this merry-go-round. The Republicans win. They change the bill. Uh, they go out of power, the Democrats uh, fix what the Republicans did, and it's, uh, it's a merry-go-round. And, and uh, here, here's another problem. When, you, when, when somebody wins, what they decide, you know, I mean, nobody, who's, I mean, why would anybody listen to me? But, uh, we are now. <laughs> but, but look at this. As soon as they win, uh, the first thought is, let's see, why don't we overreach? <laughs> Got a mandate, right? Yeah, and so what, instead of waiting, I mean, you know, start out the first bill. Uh, we all, uh, we will declare Sunday to continue to be Sunday. Uh, we we think that the sun uh, shines. I mean, and, and, and then you move on down. But what you do is you come in, boom, with with the thing that you want the most, which means they hate the most. And so it, it starts out uh, in a huge conflict right from the beginning. Biggest piece of feedback I get is from folks who want governance to work again. They want to see yeah. base, the basics happen. They want to see us, you know, make sure that we have a fiscal plan for the next fiscal year before the next fiscal year starts. Um, they want to. The, people always ask, "Don't you are, don't you ever work with Republicans? Do you have um, are there people you can talk to? Is it that more people need to be in D.C. more often so they form relationships?" And I think that. Um, the, the kind of big desire for people is to see people lead, make decisions on policy, and help move things forward. And that's really also an issue of leadership and making sure that bipartisan work actually shines through. And I think the biggest frustration I hear right now from folks on both sides of the aisle when I go home is um, this idea, and Speaker Ryan kind of put this forward when we talked about health care, when he was talking about health care, um, to the Republican caucus. He said, if we don't pass this bill, we'll be forced to work with Democrats. And most people in my district would say, wouldn't the right thing be to have people work together in the first place and to have bipartisan legislation for all of the reasons that Emmanuel just mentioned? And, um, and so folks want to know why that's not happening. And there's a, a lot of reasons, but one big reason is leadership saying that we're going to help bipartisan legislation move, because there are times when people are working together, and many of those bills in the House don't even make it to the floor, and we don't see some of the efforts that are going on. You know, 
advice for a red state, if, if uh, Candace, again, listening or watching or whatever, in a red state, I've always found out in any state or anybody in public service, if you trust me with your money, you know I'm not going to throw your tax dollars away. If I gain your trust with your pocketbook, I can gain your trust with many other policy decisions. So the first thing you do, get your financial house in order. I say I'm fiscally responsible and socially compassionate. With that being said, I'm, gonna get my, I'm not going to make you pay for something that I've made a political promise that I'm going to put a burden on somebody else. I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to find a pathway forward. And when I was governor, I couldn't. They said, How'd you, how did you all get your house state in such good shape financially? I said, I said no more, and I said yes. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do everything. I just couldn't do it. And I made everybody come to the table with some, some skin in the game. Mm -hmm. I didn't let anybody walk free. And Democrats have gotten a, a rap, uh, some, some deserved and some undeserved, that we have no accountability and responsibility. Uh, I'll go back to the health care. There's no way that you can repeal what we have in this health care bill because every demographic of my state gets hurt. But 180,000 West Virginians got health care for the first time. The greatest gift of wealth they've gotten was a health, health card. Not one word of instructions how to use the darn thing. Not one word of instructions of how you should use it. No conditions whatsoever. Unfettered. And then we wonder why it's a runaway train. And I said, as Democrats, we've got to sit as a compassion. My Republican friends, don't throw them off. Give them a chance to show you they appreciate it, they've earned it, they respect it. Show them the conditions of how to live a healthy lifestyle. Give some education classes. Show uh, about not going to the emergency room but going to the doctor's visit doing routine checkups and maintenances that manage uh, a quality life care. And I says, get them from the welfare to the workfare, but you have to have a healthy individual. Have the compassion to work it that way. We're going to be able to hopefully forge that in the Senate sooner or later. We have 11 former governors there. If the 11 former governors can't sit down in a bipartisan way, this town is, is in serious problems. If those 11 can't look at it, with clearer eyes because we've had to work with legislators, we've had to bring contentious groups together, and we've had to make decisions. And if uh, I, I think we're, we have a group together, Nucleus, that we can help, really help. Okay. Let's open up uh, the yeah. conversation a little bit to folks in the audience. So I'll start with uh, people from the press if you have a question, and then I'll move to other folks. Uh, and Molly's got a microphone right here she can share. So yeah, go ahead. Right, here. right over here, Molly. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Libby Watson. I'm with Fusion. Um, so this is a question for Senator Manchin. Uh, so it was reported yesterday that you were organizing some bipartisan healthcare talks um, for other senators. So first, I'm wondering, did you get anywhere with that? Is that going anywhere? <laughs> um, second, I'm interested in what you just said about conditions on healthcare. I, I'm not. Could you be more specific about that? Basically, a man. Some states have done managed care, Medicaid. Right. I see. And. and you have to understand, in West Virginia, I, I can speak for my state, I can speak for my, probably most states. If you've never had health care in your life, the only type of care you were able to receive is an emergency room. It wasn't any type of preventive care, maintenance of any type. If your child, if you worked in a family and your child qualified for CHIPS, I guarantee that child was not introduced to routine maintenance to where we were checking BMIs and getting him in a healthy life. We just didn't do it. So... We have to start thinking differently. So I said, people are getting health care for the first time. They need some type of educational management to help them navigate this in a much more effective and efficient way. So the Republican answer to all of this health care repeal and replace was to give $600 plus billion of tax credits to some of the wealthiest companies and wealthiest Americans. But they were going to balance that out to CBO so they could score it was taking away $800 billion in services to the poorest. That's a non-starter in most American communities or cities, rural or urban, that's a non-starter. So once they got past, past they couldn't do that, then they had to start, okay. And I kept saying, we have, the markets have to have more product in the market, there has to be more flexibility to the products. What do you do with a high need person that's pre-existing condition? You sure can't leave them out. And, and that's where Ted, and Ted Cruz, when we were talking, and Ted says, well, we're gonna give them options. I says, well, I have an option to buy a Rolls Royce. I just can't afford it. <laughs> I have options, okay? These types of things here are just common sense. So I said, we've got to manage that high need group or high expense group differently than we do everybody else. And the synergies we have from the savings of people that we expanded to 20 million plus, there has to be some synergies there. 
So Democrats have to understand it's not unfeathered. It's got to have some conditions of how you use it, where you use it, you can't abuse it, and you know, hold you accountable and responsible for this. States have done that and have showed some pretty good results from it. And uh, I just, I just believe there's there's a solution to every problem. I really do. If I didn't, I wouldn't be sitting here. But boy, I'm telling you, this is a tough. This this really tests your resolve here. This place does. Thank you. It's uh, Dana Marshall. I really appreciate Third Way doing this. I'm sort of an economic guy, so I know I've read a bit about um, Congressman Cleaver's proposals on economics, the mi minimum wage, the uh, pre-K, student debt. That's fine, but this conversation, I think, is in a way more important uh, because of the focus on cultural issues. How do we win the House, and how do we sort of factor in those deficiencies that I think a lot of us feel the party has in terms of outreach on cultural issues. I was listening very carefully to all three of the congressmen here and uh, trying to make a distinction between being polite and cultural sensitivities of the public. There is a difference between that. Uh, Senator Manchin was talking about how you handle people that are difficult. You were talking about people that were rejecting you. That's sort of a matter of politeness, but aren't we talking about something different when we're talking about the cultural, uh, in our inability in many states, districts, to be able to deal with that? I wonder if I could draw out the speakers a little bit about what is it that Democrats need to do better, including uh, national candidates next time, on this issue of being able to resonate better with uh, the broader American cultures, say, in West Virginia, not just the West Side, that kind of question. Let me, you want to start? No, I'll, I'll, I'll end First, up. I was going to say, I think it's about uh, respect and going in and listening to people. I think listening is a huge part of our jobs, is to go where people are, um, listen to their stories, listen to their <laughs> issues, and um, that may be cultural, that may be economic, may, but if you're not there and present and listening, then I don't think we can do our jobs to the best of our ability. And I think people appreciate you being there. I know I have a big district, and so a lot of very small towns, and making sure I make the point to go to those small towns to sit down and listen to folks and understand their issues is important. And I, I don't think people expect me to be exactly like them. I think they expect me to respect their issues and to listen and to do my best to do what I can to, to put policies together that keep those, those um, pieces of feedback in mind. And um, that's what people appreciate. And they understand that my district's big and diverse and there are other points of view, but I think a lot of folks in our rural communities in particular feel like people don't take the time to come out, don't take the time to listen and truly understand. And so I do think that that's, um, it's not just about being polite, it's about respect and earning, earning that trust. I think we also have to move away from the, uh, the politics of protestation uh, and, 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 and become carriers of political inspiration. In spite of Donald Trump's election, I am still convinced that the American people would rather see people who would, as they're talking with them, be more comfortable with uh, uh, inspiration uh, rather than uh, insults. And I think we have to uh, go after um, people and ask them to embrace their better angels. I, I am still, I, I, I'm a seminary graduate. I've pastored for 37 years. Um, and I, I, I believe the human condition is good. I believe that most Americans are good human beings. Uh, and, and so that means that uh, 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 it's better to inspire than insult. They will respond. I mean. I mean, why would we go and just throw junk on people and, and throw mess on people? You know, we, our go job is to pull people up. And, and I, I said yesterday uh, uh, in the lunchroom with a lot of my colleagues, look, let's, leave, let's stop criticizing the affordable, uh, whatever they call it. Uh, leave it alone. I mean, what we need to do is present what we are for, present ways to correct it. 
Uh, I mean, listen to what the senator just said a few minutes ago. I mean, you know, we don't need to beat it up. It, it is self-defeating. Uh, the public is beating it up. Uh, you know, so, I mean, let's, let's start telling people what we are for, what, because uh, uh, I don't think, I mean, the, the public is, you're right, the public's tired of, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a Democrat, you gotta attack uh, Republicans and everything they do, and if you're a Republican, you do the, the reverse. Uh, I think people are sick of it. And I, and I think people are always ready for inspiration. And I think we, as Democrats, we ought to give it to them. Well, Let me just say, if I can, yeah. West Virginia is the least diverse state in the nation. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, John Kennedy came there in 1960 because he knew if he couldn't break down the religious barriers. So it's mostly white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Uh, coming from an Italian descent family, uh, being Catholic, I'll never forget, I'm sitting by the television in 1960, and I'm watching my mother. Uh, got, my family got so excited because John Kennedy, and I never seen him get this excited about a national election. Here's this young, vibrant, even though we had Eisenhower before, and Trump member, but now we got John Kennedy, this real young, vibrant, 43-year-old man. And, but he happens to be Catholic, too, so I'll never forget. I'm watching. I thought, it had to be Chad Only. Or it had to be maybe Walter Cronkite. And they were saying, it's been said that if John Kennedy... Uh, wins the presidency that the Pope will run the country. I looked at my mom and I said, well, mom, they don't know the Catholics we know. <laughs> so right then, as a little kid, I understood diversity. You know, we are acceptable. There shouldn't be, there should, you know, intolerance is not acceptable. Uh, diversity is not acceptable. Discrimination is not acceptable. But don't tell me how, what I do in my own house in my bedroom. Don't tell me what bathroom I got to use. People in rural, rural areas says, listen, we can figure this one out. We figured out some more tougher challenges. You know, we're not going to discriminate. We're not going to con condemn anybody because in these little coal camps, it wasn't black and white or this or that. It was that we're all having some pretty tough times. Okay, how do we hook, work together? How do we help each other? So I, I you know, I, I was raised in, I think, and I just look at my upbringing. I just so appreciative of the people that gave me the life I had because I saw it so much differently. I never saw discrimination. I had kids I played ball with. They slept in our home. We slept in their home. We all helped each other. My grandfather had a little grocery store. When the mines went on strike, Papa kept giving groceries away until we had nothing on the shelves, and they cut his credit off because they said, Papa, you can't give it away. And he says, they're hungry. What am I going to do? But as soon as the mines went back to work, they all paid him. So we watched this evolution of we're all together here. I don't care what, what run of the tree you think you're on. You know, <laughs> you better watch where you came from. And, and take care of that person too, but I, I don't know. I just we're just splitting this country apart, and there's so many good people. Not having an immigration policy that works for everybody, it's crazy. Not having security for our country so the people want us to do harm is also crazy. And we can find that balance if you all would just if we can get the house, just <laughs> your colleagues in the house. The immigration bill that we had it was a pretty balanced bill as well. And I'll never forget John Boehner, I asked, I'm, and I like John, John's a good friend, and I said, John, pass that bill. He says, I thought I could get it passed, Joe, until Eric Cantor got beat. He says, they used, diver they used uh, yeah. um, uh, oh, the well, yeah, the immigration thing was big for him, saying it was amnesty. Uh -huh. There was no amnesty in that bill whatsoever, not and a bit, and they just in, uh, couldn't get it up. My district, a diverse district, you think of something as partisan as immigration reform out here, but... My farmers, technology folks, uh, law enforcement, you know, families, security, they right? all, and I have a border, yeah, they all security. want comprehensive immigration reform. And so yeah. it may be very binary in this Washington. It was not um, that divisive in our Washington. And, um, and I think it's important to remember that when we're talking about things, because we make things very black and white here, but at home they're not as black and white, and there lies an opportunity to pass legislation. Well, just like here. Democrats have been tagged by not caring about the secure. My goodness, I think Democrats are as, as hawkish as anybody in securing our borders and making sure that we have proper vetting coming in, all the things that we know where our poorest areas are, and we're working very hard on that, but uh, it's, just, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Let's go here to yes. Alex. Hi, Alex Clearfield with National Journal. Uh, I have a question for Congressman Cleaver. You said earlier in the panel that Democrats need blue dogs to help regain the House majority, but especially since the election of Donald Trump, we've seen a lot of enthusiasm 
in the progressive grassroots of people who may not have been engaged in politics before really kind of you know, getting themselves engaged in the process and even considering running for Congress. How, how can the Democratic Party kind of heal this, I guess, philosophical gap between the progressives who say, you know, no to everything Trump says and <laughs> want to bring back, you know, a really you know, progressive national platform to Congress versus people, you know, on the more conservative side of the party who think that the Democrats need to target, you know, Midwestern and some Southern and, you know, suburban sunbelt seats to get more moderate and conservative Democrats, you know, running and to regain the majority. Um, you don't know my Aunt Edna, but <laughs> uh, every Tuesday night, uh, I'm a native Texan with, with, uh, right outside of Dallas, a little place called Waxhatchee. And uh, every Tuesday night, we'd go over to Aunt Edna, my mother, um, my three sisters and me. My dad uh, ran a clear, uh, cleaners, so he, he didn't go. Every Tuesday night, it's my, only, my mother's only living relative that we knew about, her father's uh, uh, sister. But, I mean, for me, Aunt Edna told stories, and she, I mean, she was the smartest human on, on the planet. And she said, one night I'm sitting there on the porch. My sisters wouldn't, wouldn't listen. I did. I sat there and listened to every word. And one night she said, let me tell you something. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth, one slice of bread, and then put them to bed. Sunday, I go to church. My mother and grandmother and everybody were shaking hands with the pastor. I hung around. I said, Reverend, what are we going to do about that woman who uh, Aunt Edna told me lives in a shoe? <laughs> I said, she, you know, and, and, and she doesn't have food. The kids are in trouble. <laughs> and so the preacher's looking around. You know, my mother's pulling on my arm trying to get me to go. When I look back now, that's the day I became a Democrat. <laughs> um, that, that is the day that I thought, you know what, uh, I, I, for the rest of my life, I want to be concerned about that woman in the shoe. And I think that most people yeah. want, to, want to help that woman in the shoe. Yeah. We just have to figure out uh, you know, how to do it in a way uh, that appeals to people who have different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, and uh, I, I will never abandon that. I will never abandon that. Uh, uh, if that's progressive, then call me progressive. I will never abandon that. I will never abandon the things that, that uh, Roosevelt brought into existence. I will never abandon those. But it doesn't keep me uh, from dealing with other issues that are significant as well. Um, you know, highlight for me, Higginsville has one of the largest Confederate uh, cemeteries in the country. One of my big supporters in Higginsville said, you got to come up for the big Higginsville uh, uh, parade uh, in, to, in the cemetery. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> but, but she wasn't, I mean, she, uh, she voted for me. <laughs> she, it didn't even cross her mind. You know, just, you know, now, so now what I can do is start beating up on her. You know, because, I mean, who, who would, who would have, who supporting you would ask you to do that? With, with the consciousness that uh, there's something that's not quite right there, uh, you know. She didn't, I mean, they didn't think about it. And, and so I'm just saying, I don't think we have to say, okay, we're gonna be progressive. Uh, 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 we're, we're gonna move a little more conservative. I think we, the, the best way to function in life is be to be who you are. Uh, and I became a Democrat concerned about people who, who are hurting. And whether they're in a coal mine in West Virginia or whether they're in a soup line in New York City, those are the people we have to give a concern about. And most Americans want to do that. They just don't want to waste their money. I can't figure out the definition of progressive. Uh, and the reason I say that, because I know conservative Democrats that consider themselves progressive in the, on issues, and I know liberal Democrats that consider themselves progressive. I don't know if it's another uh, emiration of, of, of being liberal and ultra-liberal. I don't know. I, I really don't. I think in every case, if you pick the issue, Republicans are progressive on certain issues. They'll say, I'm a progressive on this issue. 
I don't know where this all this whole iterations come from. I just say you better know your state, know your demographics of the state, know the person that's running that fits in that demographic, that has a that has a fighting chance to succeed. That's all. Don't put somebody up against long odds when you know the odds are so long that there's nobody in Las Vegas booking it. Okay? <laughs> it's just not going to happen. But if you get the right person, you get the right team around you and the right mix, you can find the right candidate, and that candidate can do a real good job. I don't care whether they're progressive conservatives, progressive liberals, progressive, you know, just people that want to get something done. And right now the people that are, I think what they're saying is that, listen, well, I think we sit on the sidelines too long. It's time to get involved. And that's on both sides. Yeah. Let's go here and then there. Um, hi, uh, Claire Foran with The Atlantic. Um, Senator Manchin, you know, you've talked a little bit about recruitment and candidate recruitment and how that's important. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on, you know, you talked about the Georgia House race and maybe there being not the best fit there. What, I mean, why do you think that happened, especially in a time when Democrats do have a lot of people that are energized that want to run? And do you, have you seen other races in some of the special elections where you feel like it's just been kind of a mismatch, and how do you think Democrats well, can improve? Uh, historically, Democrats have been pretty open about the process. We engage in democracy. We want you to be involved. I've encouraged people to run. The person's running against me now, I encourage her to run. She, she took me up on it. She's running against me. Uh, <laughs> But with that being said, that's healthy. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Democrats have always been more open. Republicans have been more methodical about this, and they've looked and they've calculated and they've run polls and they've run demographics. They pretty much have it down to a science. They've done much more. Ours has been put, pretty much a more open book. Four or five jump in, boom, boom, boom. The person that survives the primary is a person that we're supposed to be behind. Sometimes we are and sometimes we aren't. The person doesn't fit. So... We just got to be a little bit more thoughtful if and DCCC and DSCC and the DGA and the people that are involved in these statewide races and these congressional races are looking at it differently today than they did before. Is that a person they're going to get behind? Are they going to put their, their wish list or their recruiting list or their, uh, their uh, money list behind this person? They're looking at it differently. Republicans got a pretty good jump on us on that one. Uh, and I'm just saying just realistically look. I, I've got a state that's socially conservative. You know, I grew up socially conservative. But I grew up with compassion, too, being socially conservative. Get an extremely liberal person in the state, the odds are kind of stacked against them a little bit. They're good people. The odds just are going to be stacked that things would have to really break right for them to be a competitor. You've got to come to realization. You know, I, I, I said so many times, I didn't, uh, I didn't create the market. I just want to compete in it. I, if I'm going to compete, and I've got to be realistic enough to know what I'm competing and who I'm competing against. Uh, uh, you know, and I've been able to be fairly successful being able to identify that because it just, you can tell. You can just, this is a feeling. I don't, know, I don't know how to tell you any different than that. But the people that have all the wherewithals and, and all of the uh, data, they can pretty much pinpoint it down. And how about people that, uh, that do are my polling? Uh, my polling people... They've never missed it by one point. In all my races, not a lot of races, never missed it by a point. They can, it's just almost a science. Now it's getting harder and harder. The polling is getting harder because people aren't traditionally answering or talking or on the phone, land phones and things. So it's a little bit more, it's more of a science now. You have to be able to get into this social arena in order to get a good feel of what's going on. So that's why the polling hasn't been as accurate. It's we have tough. time for one more question right here. Fred Bonick from the Daily Ripple. I'm also a Gold Star dad. And <clears throat> I was also groomed as a um, Baptist uh, missionary. And I wanted to say I learned something that um, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you give a man, you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Democrats want to give a man a fish, and the Republicans want to give um, people who already have fish more fish. And the question <laughs> I want to ask is for, to the senator. Um, when you're talking to Ted Cruz, he's a smart guy. I mean, he's a, uh, you know, Princeton grad. Sure. It seems, why would he even present a plan, and why would anybody look at him in this, with a straight face when he's saying he wants to create junk insurance again and, and take 
eight hundred billion dollars away from you know poor people. Why 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 yeah. why in a state like Texas where they have the lowest in, in, insurance rate? I mean the lowest uh, amount of insured people. How do you how do you stand there and look at him and not go? Huh? Well, you have to understand that, that what, what's going on in the country. You got a movement of the country moving uh, uh, health care for all, one payer system, right? There's a movement going that direction. The Republicans are in control right now, and they want to basically uh, protect the market, the market health care system that we have. They're going to fight to their nth degree to protect the market. You can go ahead and fight it all you want. Can you use a hybrid of a market with getting more people involved, holding them accountable and responsible? And I said, Ted, that's when I told Ted, I said, hey, Ted, you're saying you want flexibility, you want block grants, you want different things, you want states. I have 13th Amendment. Being a former governor, no one believes in the 13th Amendment more than I do, independent state rights. But with that, I need a partner, too. I can't do it by myself. So I have told him, I said, you know, it's, he said, but, Joe, they can choose because it's going to be available to them. We're not leaving anybody behind. I said, Ted, but they can't afford it because the market's going to shift to where you're giving so much flexibility and they're going to cherry pick the market. You're going to leave all the people who've been left behind before in a very conundrum to where they're going to say, what do I do? I know it's there. I just can't buy it. I got no assistance, no help. Give me some way to manage this. So they're going to protect the market. They want a market driven system. I want to try to live within this realm is find a hybrid to where I have the market but I also have the compassion to make sure I've not left anybody behind. So, but guess. <laughs> oh, no, I, I know that. But he's tried his plan. He had a right to try his plan. He couldn't get the votes for it. That stopped yesterday. They're going to go down now to where they're still going to have a vote. Don't ask me why, because we got three Republicans that said three women. The three women Republicans absolutely says no. That means they're down to 49. And with that said, I guess they just have to take a vote for the sake of satisfying their base. Uh, we've started talking to some people that are moderates and reasonable on both sides. We're getting that conversation going. We're finding out what we can agree on. Can we build some benchmarks to build something off of that's responsible? They're, you know, there's people that want to starve the beast. They don't want any new revenue. They want nothing. They just want to say we can't afford it. We're collapsing. We're in a disarray. We're in, you know, I, I, nobody wants to fix things because it's easier to blame somebody for something that's broke than to give people, everyone, I said the best politics is good government. If things work good, everybody takes credit. Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, we did something together. For some reason, they don't get it here in this town. That's how we survived in our states. But I, 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 I got to deal with all of them. I, I live, I've always lived in the real world. I've always, I was born in a, a real coal mining town, and I saw, I saw challenges. I've, I've, I've been through disasters. I've had, when I was governor, I had three mine disasters. A lot of people lost their lives. Uh, and as, as Congress, both congressmen and congresswomen were talking, people have to know you're for real. When you first go to a disaster, such as any of these, first thing they think you're there for the, for the, uh, for the, for, the, for the picture, for the uh, bite, uh, television bite or whatever. But if you stay there and stay with them, about 3 o'clock in the morning when everybody's left and you're still sitting there and they start pouring their heart out to you, and then you start bonding. And after the second or third day, they know, hey, you're with me. But it takes that. If people aren't willing to do that, they can read through that. But I, I'm hoping, I think there's good in everybody. I would like to think Ted and everybody else has the compassion for that person. They truly believe the market will take care of that person. Well, guess what? You don't have one percenters and 99 down here if the market's going to take care of it. There has to be some adjustments and some balancing going on. And I don't begrudge anybody that's done well in life. God bless you. I just don't want to think that you were able to be privileged because you used all the conditions of your wealth for what you've taken advantage of to increase your wealth while I didn't have the same opportunity. I couldn't, buy, I, I couldn't hire my own lobbyist. I couldn't hire my own accountant and all these people to do the things I needed done for me to give me those advantages. We, you know, we have a tax plan. We have to have, you have to have a revenue source to satisfy a government that is the hope of the world. And we are the hope of the world, make no mistake. No one can take our place. No one's willing to take our place. Nobody wants to take our place. They just want to take us down. As long as we remember that, we'll be okay.
Well, I got to say, I feel quite optimistic after this conversation. I hope you all do too. And I think if we can get candidates like you all in every single place of the country, we're going to be doing pretty good. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.